Hey church family, this is Pastor Darren and I hope that you're doing well. If you're watching this video, it's actually Saturday evening when I'm recording this uh, and that means that uh, I have gone to bed or woken up not feeling well, uh, starting to experience symptoms. Um, but as far as, uh, as things stand tonight, uh, I feel fine. My family and I feel fine. And uh, <clears throat> we had hoped, uh, my family and I had hoped to be able to be with you uh, on Sunday um, to worship with you and to start the year off in, in prayer and in the Word together as a church family. But um, like many of you, over the course of this past uh, year, our turn as a family to be directly exposed to COVID-19 came uh, at the end of last week uh, on our Christmas trip. And so, uh, as I said, so far we don't have any symptoms, but we're just trying to take the precautions and are voluntarily self-quarantining for these 10 days. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to be back with you in person next Sunday on January 10th. So we look forward to that. Um, but speaking of in person, I, I mean, that, that matters, doesn't it? Personhood, personality, personableness. Uh, I mean, there are just all kinds of ways that we uh, use that word to get our heads around the idea of identity. I mean, what is it that makes a person a person? What makes you, you? What makes me, me. Um, identity. N knowing who a person is is important to a midwife and it's important to a mortician. You don't want babies getting mixed up. You don't want bodies getting mixed up. And identity is important to everyone else along the whole spectrum of life. Fingerprints, footprints, photographs, blood types, DNA, passports. I mean, there are lots of ways that we have to ascertain a person's outward identity. But what, what forms a person's deeper identity? What is it that forms uh, the real inner core of who a person is? Now, some people would say that individual identity uh, is mainly determined by social factors, right? Uh, we're just the product of our raising. We're the product of our parents. We're the product of our communities of origin. We're the product of our ethnic or racial backgrounds. We're the product of economic groups or, or education. Others would root individual identity in inner things, an in inner matrix of genetics, emotional makeup, passions, talents, desires, in other words, we are biologically and psychologically predetermined to be who we are and to be how we are. Nowadays, it's, it's become really popular to see identity as a purely self-defined reality. Do you know what the word autonomy means? Autonomy. Well, it comes from two root words, auto and nomos, which is auto meaning self. Uh, nomos means law. Auto nominee means self law. And you know what? Since the Garden of Eden, fallen mankind has wanted to be a law unto himself, a law unto herself. Nowhere uh, in our modern moment is radical autonomy more on display than in the realm of gender and sexual identity. With the male-female gender binary that has prevailed throughout human history, now seen as just a, a relic, uh, a, an oppressive, outdated, outmoded social institution, sanity about personhood, sanity about identity, is being exchanged for insanity. When the self is given a, a godlike status, the self then is what decides and defines what is true at any given moment based on any given feeling or fancy. 
And now all of that is just to say again that identity is an enormous and, and an unavoidably important subject for Christians. We're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to have an answer to the world's confusion about identity in a world that, that denies fundamental moral absolutes, in a world that, that bases everything on self-determined identity, whether it's identity politics, identity economics, identity spiritualities, all with a capital I, right? In that kind of world, we are called as Christians to hold firmly to a, a faith that is itself identity-based, but the identity at the base of our faith is, is the one identity to which all other identities, true and false, are subject, right? I mean, we are called to declare, we are called to display the identity of our God, the identity of our Savior, the one person from whom all personhood is derived, the one person to whom every other person must answer, ultimately. He is the creator. Our God is the uncreated one. And thus he has that right to be answerable, to be the one to whom all people will answer. We're not just here as Christians to showcase Jesus. I mean, we are here for that. But we're also here to show a world full of self-obsessed people what freedom and Joy there is to be found in being self-unobsessed. Uh, the joy and the freedom of, of finding true individual identity and true personhood in the person and identity of Jesus Christ. You can read the New Testament and, and page after page, time after time, you're going to hear the words, in Christ, in Christ. Christ. Over and over again, particularly in the Apostle Paul's writings, you're just going to hear that phrase again and again, in Christ. We are to, we're to be in Christ. We're to find ourselves in no other uh, identity than in the identity of Jesus, God's Son. And now, as in any time of, of national or global crisis, 2020 did see the emergence of some really great examples of selflessness. I mean, just think about all the, the healthcare workers and, and, and those who've put their lives on the line day after day, hour after wearying hour, caring for the sick, caring for those uh, in need. Uh, but rather than expose our deep need for others and, and, and increase our care for others, I fear that, that by and large, many folks, maybe even some of us, for many of us, the isolation uh, has kind of worked the other way. Uh, and it's, it's intensified what was already an unhealthy self-focus. In many ways, the world is, is a more hateful and hostile place today than it was just a year ago. Hunkering at home and hiding behind phones, jeering and, and jabbing on social media out of fear or, or out of boredom or both has created a population that I believe is more desperate than ever for the truth of the gospel, but perhaps more hardened than ever against it. This is our mission field, church. This is the world into which God has placed us this age, this time, this season in human history. This is our mission field. This is our calling to, to showcase Jesus and to show the world the freedom of finding our identity and our joy in him. In 2021, there, there are so many things uh, that, that we want and hope to be different and better. I mean, would you agree with that? I, I think we can all uh, say we hope 2021 is different and better than 2020. Uh, if, if my not being there with you, though, uh, is any indication, if your lingering grief is any indication, if your unresolved 
disappointments, uh, the continued presence of COVID-19, and now new mutations of the virus, uh, if society's ongoing polarization and strife are any indications, if they tell us anything, it's this. It's that a new calendar isn't going to make everything, or anything for that matter, better. And yet we need to ask. It's fair to ask. It's right to ask, well, what can be improved? What can be changed for the better? What What is an achievable goal for the new year? What What is a reachable aim? What's a, a worthy and attainable aspiration? Trust me, whether personally or parentally or pastorally, across the whole spectrum of my life, I want 2021 to be better than 2020. I'd like to drop 30 pounds this year. I'd like to have uh, more energy, um, feel better, just be in general healthier. I, I'd like to do a better job at, of dating my wife and, and really pursuing her and, and having a, a deeper, more more um, responsive and, and, and uh, uh, sharing type of relationship rather than just more of what's kind of been a survival mode in our marriage this year as we care for our kids and try to care for our church family and all that. I really want to pursue Deborah more this year. I want to be uh, a more consistent, uh, stronger discipling influence on my kids' lives. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to see our, our church um, attendance resurge. I want to see uh, more gospel conversations. I want to see more conversions and, and baptisms. I want our church to be more engaged in meeting needs out in the community this year than we were in 2020. I want to see Cleveland Hope, our, our network of churches that, that I get the privilege of serving. I want to see us add 10 new churches this year and not close any churches I don't want to see any any struggling churches end up having to shutter their their doors. That's that's sad to me. That's heartbreaking. I mean, and you have your 2021 personal and and family and and occupational wish lists as well, don't you? Um, it's it's not bad to want things. It's not bad to want any of those things that I I listed. It's not bad to want the things that you want for this year. But there's something better, I believe. We can also uh, go in an unhealthy direction and, and play the victim and, and list off all the things we want others to do better this year than they did last year. I mean, after all, our happiness and our hopefulness depend entirely upon what everyone else does or doesn't do, right? We all know better than that. I mean, heck... Some of us may be even be, be tempted to, to brand God the, the arch-victimizer, right? And, and, and to think that, that he needs to really just step up his game in 2021. Where were you in 2020? God, we might be tempted to think. But those are, those are fool's errands. There is something better for us than blame. How about this? How about this as a... 2021 goal. Be more in love with Jesus a year from now than you are today. How about that? Let's set all of the silliness aside and just fix our minds on falling more and more in love with Jesus by finding more and more of our joy and our identity in Him this year. Is that desirable to you? I hope it is. Uh, is that uh, something that you see as possible? I hope you see it that way because it is. But listen, uh, a goal is not a guarantee. It, it, it takes devotion to turn a desire into reality. Falling more in love with Jesus may sound like a lot of work. You're probably expecting me now to, to lay out a, a bunch of do's and don'ts. Just read your Bible more. 
pray more, fast more, attend church more, just give more to your local church, serve more, evangelize more, be less lazy, be less selfish, be less judgmental, get off Facebook, etc., etc., etc. True. I mean, there is a place for discipline in the Christian life. We're called disciples, after all. Same word. Uh, by discipline, you see, we, we do things that we may not want to do in order to feel a way we don't presently feel. Disciplined, repeated action can change the way our brains work. It can rewire our brains. It can change the way we think. Doing differently can eventually help us think differently. Doing better things repeatedly, consistently, can help us think and feel better. I mean, there's truth to that. That's, that's just neuroscience. That's how our brains were wired by God to, to be and to respond to repeated activity. Disciplined, repeated action can change the way we think. Just like exercise, uh, rest, proper diet, just like they're the path to better physical health, so also spiritual disciplines are the path to deeper communion with God, greater spiritual health. But, but just doing those things that I just listed off, those spiritual exercises, those spiritual disciplines, just doing those doesn't mean we love God more. You can... Uh, pray a whole lot more. You can read your Bible a whole lot more this year. You can get much more consistent in coming to church, being engaged and involved with church life this year. And that doesn't necessarily equate to you loving God more. Right? You see, falling more in love with someone means realizing more and more deeply that person's love for you. That's what deepening a love relationship really is. It is realizing more and more how much another person loves you. You see, that to me ought to be the definition of discipleship for us as Christians. Intentionally, deliberately, consistently, whether it's privately and collectively, decluttering our lives, focusing our lives so that we can see and experience God's love for us in Christ more deeply over time. That's what discipleship is. That's the goal of it. It's not to, to get more Bible verses memorized. It's not to get more sophisticated in our, our theological arguments. It's to love God more. And to experience and taste more of his love for us. I mean, if that's not the goal of your Bible reading, why bother? If that's not the goal of praying or fasting, why bother? If experiencing more of God's love for you is not the goal of attending church more consistently, what's the point? Is it just to gratify yourself? Is it, is it just to impress others? I mean, that's silly. Think about those who love you the most. When has your love for them grown the most? My love for Deborah has grown the most, not in the times when I've done really nice things for her. Uh, but when I've seen her do really loving things for me, especially in those times when I haven't necessarily been doing anything especially nice for her or, or uh, and really in those times when I, I know I've been ugly towards her in some way. Uh, I call these moments slap you upside the head moments because they come out of nowhere. They're, they're surprising uh, when our eyes are opened and we see how much another person cares for us and loves us, especially when we've not uh, been looking for that. But my love for Deborah has also grown in what I would call focused or 
disciplined moments. Now, these these are the moments when I've taken an intentional, deliberate opportunity, maybe a, an anniversary or whenever her birthday rolls around to to focus on her, to think about her and, and the ways that she has shown me kindness and, and grace and love along with all of her other wonderful attributes that, that endear her to me and to others as well. As God's children, we're going to have uh, both kinds of moments as well. We're going to have those slap you upside the head uh, moments, and we're going to have focused and disciplined moments of seeing more of his love for us. We need both kinds of moments uh, for our love for God to, to deepen. And and remember, when it comes to God, uh, we're not talking about another sinful person. I mean, I, I love Deborah, and I think she's great and awesome, but she's a sinner, uh, and and there are things about her that I have to overlook and forgive. Well, it's not the case with God. Uh, we don't have to overlook any flaws or, or forgive any failures when it comes to God. We're talking about the perfect person whose love for us has always been perfect. And on that note, I want to turn to God's Word now. And, and I get it. This, this has not been a typically structured sermon. We didn't jump right into a Bible passage, but I want to go to God's Word now. I want to go to um, a part of the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 31. I want to read for you just just 14 verses of that chapter. Um, And then I want to just kind of think on what we've read. And then I want to close our time together today just kind of praying through those, those themes through those words that God uh, relays to us, through the Holy Spirit, through the prophet Jeremiah. They're ancient words. They were words that were given several centuries before Jesus was even born. But they're words that are looking forward to what Jesus would accomplish in the redeeming of God's people. And so here is what God says to us through Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 31, verses 1 to 14. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines, and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman and she who is in labor together, a great company. They shall return here. With weeping they shall come. And with pleas for mercy, I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, 
and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful passage? I mean, there is nothing but hope and promise and faithfulness from God in those words. Later on in this chapter, we, we find what's been called the New Covenant, and it's called that because it's, it's named that. Jeremiah uses those words. God speaks through Jeremiah and says later on, I will make a new covenant with my people. Let me just read a paragraph from later in the chapter, beginning in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Boy, is that not just a graphic and joyful and hopeful picture of what Jesus would accomplish on the cross. He purchased that for us. He provided the fulfillment of that promise for us. He is that promise of God to us. He is the embodiment of God's love to us. Rather than take this first Sunday of 2021 to unveil some grand vision of what Bridge Church may become by way of ingenuity and strategy or effort on our part, not to say that we we shouldn't be creative or strategic or, or put any effort forth this year. But rather than go that direction, I, I want to unveil an even greater vision for you. And, and it's not the vision of what Bridge may become. It's a vision of what Bridge Church already is by way of God's grace, by way of his decree, by way of the effort, not of ourselves, to Jesus Christ. And so as we pray, let's pray along these lines. As we plan for this year in our personal lives, as we pursue uh, our walk with God individually and collectively as a church family, let's keep this new covenant, let's keep the promise of Jeremiah 31 close to our hearts, and let's keep these words on our lips. As we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, let's, let's keep our mission before us of being God's covenant people, uh, of being God's joyful people who have found their identity in Christ in the world. Let's keep that at the forefront of our minds as well, because that's why we're here. We're not here for anything else. We're not here to build bank accounts. We're not here to, to build buildings. We're not here to... Um, to build uh, an earthly home for ourselves. We are here to participate uh, along with 
Christ our Savior and building his kingdom. And that comes through the declaration of the gospel. That comes through lives that that bear the marks of being transformed by the gospel that we declare. So let's let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's walk through the first part of Jeremiah 31 together as we pray. It's just let's just communicate back to God our joy in the words and the promises he's given to us. Let's pray. Would you bow with me where you're at? Oh Lord, we come before you with your words in front of us, on our minds, press them, Lord, I pray, down deep into our hearts. God, we are beginning a new year, and, and Lord, we know that, that really it's, it's just the, the changing of a, of a calendar. It's the changing of, of one day to the next. Uh, but Lord, uh, it does create in us a powerful picture of a new um, season of life. We we long for a new season of life. We we long to see uh, your hand at work in this new year. Uh, we long to uh, be more attentive to how you're working, whether that's in uh, easy, uh, comforting circumstances or very difficult and trying circumstances. But Lord, we, we want to live day by day in the hope of the promise that you've given us through Jeremiah, who speaks of Christ. Lord, we want to go into 2021 as people who you have mercifully and graciously spared from the sword in the wilderness of sin. Lord, we acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge our, our deep and desperate need for forgiveness before you. We have sinned. We have grieved your heart in untold ways. Lord, I pray that um, as I am even now in my mind uh, remembering specific sins that each of your people would would likewise um, see their sin and see their need to to confess that and repent and to turn back to you to to deny sin a reign over our lives you have spared us lord you have given us grace in the wilderness you've also given us rest father You've given us the rest of knowing Jesus. Jesus who, who comes to us and says, You who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. You, Lord Jesus, are our rest. Thank you. Lord, we are those to whom you have appeared from far away. You, you Lord, have, have shown yourself to us. Lord, these words in particular are just so powerful. We are those who you have loved with an everlasting love. God, there is no point that we could ever reach in the eternal ages of the past where it was not true that you loved us. You have loved us from eternity past with an everlasting love. It's a love that will never end. It had no beginning and it has no end. God, we thank you for that. And we know that because of your everlasting love for us, you have continued in your faithfulness to us and Lord your great faithfulness to us is is manifest in your coming for us in the person of your son the Lord Jesus Christ we praise his name Lord we thank you 
for his obedient, willing spirit and humbling himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant and coming here to die in our place that our sins might be forgiven and our relationship with you restored by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being the embodiment of our Father's everlasting love. Lord, we are those, finally, uh, in this prayer, we, we are those who will be built, who are being built, and who will be built by your own very hand, by your Spirit. You are building us, Lord into a kingdom of priests. You are building us into an everlasting kingdom of saints and priests who will praise your name and enjoy the glory of your presence forever and ever and ever. So God, uh, as we stare forward into a new year, we pray, O oh God, that, that this very old promise, these very old truths would stabilize us, would steady us in our position in you, a position which you have provided. We thank you, Lord, for your great love. We pray, Lord, that in both surprising ways and in focused and diligent, dis disciplined ways, Lord, this year, we would see more of your love for us. And in seeing more of the depth of your love for us, we would fall more deeply in love with you. I pray this. Lord, I ask this for my own self, and I ask this for your dear people, the people of Bridge Church. I ask, Lord, this also for the people of our communities, our workplaces, our schools, the people we interchange with day to day, Lord, that, that our witness to them would be your Spirit's jumping off point to start a new life to call forth faith from those who today do not have faith in Jesus. Let us be your witnesses. Let us be your spokespeople in this world for the glory of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray this. Amen. God bless you all, and thank you for your patience. Um, with this video and I pray that uh, in the days and weeks ahead uh, we will have a great many more opportunities to, to be physically together, to pray together, to, to encourage one another together, and to worship our Savior together as we celebrate His love. God bless you. Have a great week and happy 2021 to you.